Welcome to IGN's Greatest Minds. In this four part series, we'll show you how Minecraft, yes, Minecraft, can put you on the path to becoming a fully fledged engineer. But since I have no idea what I'm doing, I've invited Wild Engineering, a redstone specialist, to show us the ropes. And by ropes, I'm referring to concepts of electronic circuitry, assembling our new binary adder, our four bit decoder, and our fully functioning keypad. So, yeah, ropes. Brought to you by the US Air Force. There are many ways to serve in uniform and out, full time or part time. Learn more at airforce.com. Welcome back, everyone. In the last episode, we learned about how binary logic gate delay works, built a 10 bit instant carry adder, created a 4 bit decoder, and learned how to build a working keypad. This time around, we're learning how to convert a decimal input into a binary value, one at a time, how to multiply any number by a constant value. We'll talk about a memory structure called a data flip-flop, also known as a DFF, and we'll modify our instant carry adder to multiply by a constant value. There's a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. In the previous episode, we upgraded our binary adder by making it more efficient with a wider range of numbers. But the binary system is not a language everyone can read or use. So in this episode, we're looking to reconstruct our binary adder to create a data loop. This data loop is a memory system that will allow us to input numbers using the decimal system, the way we see numbers every day and convert it to binary, a system that's necessary when working with electronics. Let's get started. So let's talk about converting a decimal number into binary, digit by digit. We're going to look at this from right to left, starting with 10 to the 0, which is a value of 1. Next is a value of 10, then a value of 100, just like we did before. Using 256 as an example, let's enter our first value. If we enter a 2 here, we get out a binary 2, which as we can see is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. That's how you represent 2 in 10 bits. Next, let's try entering a 5. This would shift the 2 over, giving us a 25. When output to binary, this would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. Now if we enter a 6, shifting both our 2 and 5 over, interpreted in 10-bit binary, 256 is represented as 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. This system is what we'll make in just a bit. Before we get to that though, I want to show you how to multiply any number by a constant. In this example, let's use 10 as that constant. What we'll do for this is decompose the value into its binary representation. In this case, 10 is shown as 8 plus 2, so we can distribute our variable across, turning it into 8a plus 2a. You might notice that these are both powers of 2. 8 is 2 to the 3, while 2 is 2 to the 1. This is equivalent to left shifting like we mentioned in the last section, since every time you shift you double the value. So if we double it 3 times we get 8, and if we double it once we get 2. This means that we can write out its value in terms of left shifts. We can take a and left shift it 3 times, plus a left shifted once. This is how we're going to implement our times 10 constant multiplication. We're going to take the wires and shift them over a little bit, and plug them into a different input, going left 3 and left once, then summed by the adder. Let's use an example to break down why this works. Let's use blue blocks and input the number 3, making one of the true bits a different color so we can keep track of what's happening. Let's go one bit at a time, and shift them by both 3 shifts and 1 shift. Taking the light blue first, it needs to shift over 1 position, meaning it goes here. And then it also needs to shift over 3 positions, meaning that one goes here. Let's do the same for the blue block, shifting it over 1, and then shifting it over by 3. Now if we were to sum these true bits, you'd get a 16, an 8, a 4, and a 2 which makes 30. 3 times 10 is 30, so our logic works. This is the general principle we're trying out here with this machine build. So let's get into the hardware of our build. First up is learning how data memory works. We're using a mechanic in Minecraft known as repeater locking. If we set up our system to look like this, this repeater locks the one next to it. We can put our input here on a redstone lamp, wire it to the locked repeater, and then put our output on the other side. Now if we place a button here and push it, the data from our input is written into the cell. In this case our input was 0, so the cell stays empty. Now if I turn on our input and press the button again, the cell opens and closes, latching the value into the cell. So even if I disable our input, that cell keeps the value. This type of structure is called a data flip-flop, and we're using it for data memory in our machine. This allows us to hold the state of the number we entered, so we can compute the times 10 value, plus the new input number. Now that we know how it works, Let's build one that takes up less space. In this case, we're placing our repeater that acts as the lock and then locking it with the comparator. Set the comparator to subtract mode and it'll have to pull power from a container. So we'll place a barrel next to it. 
We'll place a totem in the barrel to provide signal strength, pulling the signal through and locking the repeater. Let's place another repeater on the barrel by holding shift and right clicking. Place another comparator next to it, put that one on subtract mode as well, and then place a barrel with a totem inside next to it. So now we have the same structure on both levels. We'll come back to our first repeater and place a barrel on top of it, adding yet another totem inside. This setup allows us to stack our system to make it perfectly aligned. Now we just need to add our inputs on this side and our outputs on the other. Adding some more repeaters and then placing our wires like this. So let's stack this, selecting position 1 over here and position 2 over here, making sure to have the entire height of the build included. We need 10 bits and we currently have 2, so let's stack it 4 times. Next. Let's learn how to wire these control lines so we can tell our system when to write or not write data. So let's add one more barrel with the totem inside over here. And now let's hook up these lines over here by building a bridge that looks like this. Placing redstone on top, let's set up a button in the middle to make sure the signal reaches. And as you can see, all of the flip flops update at the same time. Let's extend the inputs a little bit, putting them on the same level and test it out by placing switches on these inputs to write in a value. We'll press our button, and we can see that the output values are saved. If we clear it and press the button again, the value is overwritten. Now let's take our data flip-flops and connect them to our instant carry adder from the last episode. Let's capture the whole build by setting our positions using the command slash slash POS1 and slash slash POS2. And now we can make a copy of the whole thing using the command slash slash copy. Then on the adder, we'll use slash slash paste minus a to exclude the air blocks. And there you go. Next, we need to build the shifting we went over earlier. Let's pretend we already have our value shifted over to the first spot. So the output from here would have already looped all the way around and is showing up here instead of at this bit. We'll wire that in just a bit, but with that assumption in mind, we'll place two blocks there and three on the one next to it, bringing them both up and over and then repeating the sequence down the line. So we have the first one that's already shifted over, then two, which should end up here. And then this one should end up here. We'll do the same with these, repeating the sequence through all of these inputs. Then we'll wire all of these up with redstone. The last two won't have a shift since they have nowhere to go. That's all of our shifting done. This is how the hardware will be multiplying by 10. Next, we're going to loop the outputs. We'll bring those down this way using a repeater, and then down a few more blocks like this. Let's set up a few bits across so we know where these line up, and then making this pattern to place our redstone. We'll do the same thing here, and then repeating that pattern here. So we're making these zigzag shapes and blocking off where they get muddy with the other wires. We can keep these going all the way through our build, alternating between going up and down. We'll wire all of our inputs to be the same. Placing our repeaters in redstone dust. Finally, we'll connect them all together. We'll also build the last two. Now the last thing we'll have to do for these is wire them to our inputs. We'll want to line them up here, so we'll place a glass block here, making sure this signal reaches all the way. and then placing a new redstone repeater right there. We technically don't need that glass, so we can clear it and replace it with our regular stone and wire it together. We'll do the same thing on the next input, and to make this easier, let's use WorldEdit. 
We will select our first and second position, expanding by one, and stack it nine times. We can do the same for this section down here, expanding by one, and then stacking it nine times. Make sure to add the minus A after your stacking command to remove the air blocks and avoid risking accidentally overriding your carry logic. Let's connect these ones down here and check if it reaches the repeater. And it just barely does it. We're one block short. That's a fairly simple fix. We'll bring these blocks up like this, and then add a new block up here. We'll make this adjustment down the line as well. And clean up these extra blocks. Now this all loops back. We also need to implement a clearing system. We can do that by going up four blocks and adding a sticky piston with a block to cut our signals. We'll do some light wiring, and then select these positions to stack it nine times. So now if we want to clear it, we can just power this at the middle, and all of the signals will be cut at the same time. Let's also set up a way for the signal to pulse for as long as we need it to. We don't need a whole lot of time, so we'll set it to pulse for two ticks. We'll set a repeater here and push it back twice, then place our redstone torch above it and down here. Now, if I press this button here, you'll see we get a pretty quick pulse on that line. Okay, so we have this contraption, and you might be wondering how we actually use this device. I'm glad you asked. If we look at the inputs, you'll notice we have a 4, a 2, a 1, a 1, and another 1. If we add all of them together, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3, plus 2 is 5, plus 4 is 9. So we can enter a maximum value of 9 here, which works for our system since we're entering values 0 through 9 on our numpad. So let's say we want to enter the number 256. Well, I would enter a 2 first, and then we would clock it. And as you can see, we have a 2 on the output. Then we come back and enter a 5, which is a 4 and a 1. Clock that as well, and you can see that the output becomes 25, doing 2 times 10 plus 5. Next, it's going to do 25 times 10 plus our new input. So let's make that 6 on our inputs, and once we clock it, you'll see we have 256, which is represented by this output being on, which is true. Now to clear it, all we have to do is cut our signals, get rid of whatever inputs are true over here, and then clock it. Now once we uncut the wires, all of our outputs are zeros. In the next episode, we'll be wiring all of this to a control system that automates it using our numpad. Then, we'll hook up 7 segment displays so we can easily read the result. When dealing with circuitry, everything is binary. But wild engineering showed us that we can still create a system that uses a standard decimal system, something we use every day, to communicate seamlessly. But there's still one more step in making this computer interaction feel more human-friendly. Find out next time on IGN's Greatest Minds.